rebelled against you. We haven't worshipped you, the infinitely awesome creator. We've worshipped creative things. We've worshipped ourselves. We've rejected you. The fact that we can gather as blood-bought prizes of your son is amazing. The fact that we have another breath is amazing as it doesn't praise you as it ought to. Every exhale that we have ought to just be declaring the wonders of you, and we so often, even those who have been redeemed by you, have our eyes fixated on lesser things. And Father, I pray uh, that that reality would not be lost on us, would not be lost on us Christians, that we would see what we have been saved from. And I pray if there's anyone in this room, as we know there certainly is, who hasn't trusted in your son, the reality that they current sit in would not be lost on them. As we look especially to your word and see judgment today, that we would not flee and hide to try and just ignore potentially painful news. I pray for us Christians, we would not simply point the finger at other people who are outside of Christ, but rather see where is the old self trying to rear its ugly head in our own hearts. And ultimately, Father, I pray as we always do that as we get to look at your son and hear his heavy words and see his ministry on earth come to an end, that he would just become all the more exceedingly precious to us. We will spend eternity gazing at the wonderful face of your son. That will be why we get out of bed in the morning. It will be why we don't want to go to bed at night. We want to keep beholding the glory of our Savior, Jesus. We will do that for 10,000 years and then 10,000 more and 10,000 more and 10,000 more. So I pray today that as you just are, are changing us, are sanctifying us from one degree of glory to another, that that would be through beholding his face, beholding his wonders. That if we feel the sting of the need to repent, that would be a joyful road we take. And if we feel, see just the wonders of the gospel, that would just fill our hearts all the more with joy. There is an incomprehensible amount of love that your son has for us. And I pray that we would comprehend it as Paul does in Ephesians 3. I pray that in his wonderful name, Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, this week, as some of you are aware, some of you maybe not so much, and you're, you're going to get frustrated the second I mention this, uh, this week there's something really big happening, really big. It's called the NFL Draft, okay? Now, it, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I enjoy sports. Uh, I'm not, like, super dialed in. In fact, I'm, I'm, I have uh, a DNA of just like sports obsession, so I have to kind of pull back so I don't get too obsessed and just like every analogy you guys ever get in a sermon is sports. I give you messy, and that's enough, right? That's enough. Uh, and I even, believe me, every sermon I hold back messy analogies. But whether you like football or not, or sports or not, the draft in and of itself is, is quite the kind of social experiment. It's an amazing thing to see. Millions and millions of dollars go into this event. We're not playing any games. We're as far away from the Super Bowl as you could get, but eyes have been locked on the screen for months. Thousands and thousands of hours have gone in, not just for the coaches and the general managers to get the best player, but the fans, right? The Cowboy fans or the Bears fans or the Dolphins fans, hypothetically, are just watching who are we going to get and how are they going to change our team? And here's the mistake. Here's, here's the fun social experiment. Uh, I love watching the draft, not because of the players that they get. I love it when they pan to the crowd after, because there's always just like, the, you know, they, they got the groupie section of just people who are obsessed and they're painted and they look crazy. Uh, and half of them are super excited and the others are like picking up their chairs and slamming it on the ground. They're furious, right? No one's ever 100% happy. But here, here's, here's what everybody thinks, especially the fans. They think if we just got this one player, all of our problems would be done. Our team's terrible, that's why we're picking first, but don't worry. We're going to pick this one guy, Super Bowl, next year. And here's the reality. That never happens, ever, right? Ever, ever, ever. What needs to happen is like a complete overhaul of the team. The whole team is bad, so there's 22 players that play, so you need to get 22 better players and probably a better coach and probably a better GM, right, if you're a Cowboy fan, or a better owner who is also the GM, right, if you're a Cowboy fan. Uh, Jerry, if you're watching this, you know it's true. Uh, so... We watch this, 
We watch this. Here's this one thing. It's not, the, it's not true. The whole team needs to be overhauled. And so as we, you're like, what does that have to do with Jesus in Jerusalem? Follow me. As we have been watching, what have we been watching? Battle after battle after battle after battle with the Pharisees. What's Jerusalem's problem? These bad religious leaders. What's our evidence? Seven woes that we just saw next week. And so we might be tempted to think, there's the problem. Bad leadership. Get them out. Get someone better in. Maybe maybe Jesus could fill in for the Pharisees. That's what the disciples are certainly hoping for. And so you might have thought after last week's complete condemnation, seven woes, okay, problem's done. Jesus is going to take it one step further. And Jesus is going to say, no, no, no. It's not just the bad leadership that has rejected me. The entire city of Jerusalem, the entire people of God have all participated in this rejection of me. And so as Jesus comes to a close of his earthly ministry, From John's baptism of him to right now, Jesus has been ministering, calling people to the kingdom. From this point forward, he's only going to be with the disciples up until his arrest, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. As we see it come to a close, Jesus has one more thing to say. It's not just the Pharisees' problem. It's all of Jerusalem who are going to hear a final pronouncement of judgment. And so like last week, we may be tempted to think, cool, Jerusalem, yeah, boo, no one likes Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, but that's not us, right? We're here literally singing praises to Jesus' name. And last week, I had to remind us, well, let's sit in there for a second. You and I might not be first century Pharisees, and you and I might not be first century citizens of Jerusalem, but you and I are certainly, certainly in danger of the same sin that crept up into their hearts. For the Pharisees, it was hypocrisy. We're going to see today what is it for Jerusalem as well. So as we look at this passage, we'll see three things. We'll see Jesus' judgment, Jesus' tears, and Jesus' reign as king. Jesus' judgment, Jesus' tears, and Jesus' reign. And so what we'll do is we'll kind of go through the passage three times and pull out those, those three main theme. So let's look at this first one, Jesus' judgment. Look at verse 37. I'll read this whole passage. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered you, your children, together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See your houses left desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple and going away, and when his disciples came to the po- and pointed out to him the building of the temple, and he, said, he answered them, you see all these things, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Okay, so Jesus, notice, he, he is done with the Pharisees. This, this back and forth battle is finally over, but now his judgment is widening. Is widening to the whole city of Jerusalem. They've all participated in this rejection. Do you remember on, on Palm Sunday? So it's two days before this, but we looked at it several months ago. Jesus is coming in on a donkey. People are praising Hosanna, the people who have come in with him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And what was Jerusalem? As Jerusalem, the city gates crack open. How does the city receive their coming king? With great joy, Come on in, son of David, Messiah that we've been looking for. Is that how he is received? No, there's a cold, who is this reception? Not of the Pharisees, of the whole city as Jesus comes in. And who is it, as we'll see, that will cry loudly, give us Barabbas? Is it just the Pharisees that will participate and crucify him? No. It will be the whole city of Jerusalem. They're all rejecting him. So Jesus starts out, verse 37, Ah, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So a city gains a reputation by how it acts, right? We know this is true of American cities. What is Las Vegas's nickname? Sin City, right? Why? Because they sin a lot in Las Vegas. What happens there stays there, except all the reports, which lets us know you go there to sin, right? Uh, New York. What's New York's nickname? 
I don't know, you guys all mumbled. The Big Apple, that's right, whoever mumbled Big Apple, right? Everything's bigger here. This is the city with a capital T-H-E, right? Does anybody know Detroit's nickname? Motor City, right? They, they build a bunch of cars, or did, back when Chrysler was what everybody wanted to buy, right? So that's what you do. Chicago, by the way, last one. Windy City, which does not have to do with weather, it has to do with the politicians that are full of hot air. I have a source that is from Chicago that told me that. His name is Lee. <laughs> uh, okay, so you see that. that. People aren't just looking at a map and they're like, Windy City, Sin City, these are fun nicknames. No, how the city behaves earns that reputation and everybody knows here's what happens here. Gear up if you're going to travel here. What's Jerusalem's nickname? Murder City. Saint-killing city. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Remember, what is Jerusalem meant to be? It is meant to be the center of God's mission on earth. It's meant to be a new Eden. The temple is there where God's presence is said to be dwelling. This is where God's righteousness is meant to reign over the whole earth. This is where we saw in the prophets that the nations are supposed to look in and say to the city of Jerusalem, who is the God that you're worshiping? Because we want to worship him too. There's justice here. There's peace here. There's true worship here. That's who Jerusalem is meant to be. And what have they become? Quite literally, the opposite of their mission the opposite of who they're called to be. It's not just, oh, they're kind of off mission. They're doing something different. This is where God's prophets go to die. When I, I spent a couple of years in Australia, as some as you know, and the, the main thing, maybe the only thing that people prepped me for before I went to Australia was watch out for every living thing there. The spiders are as big as your fist and they can jump 10 feet, right? That's what people were telling me. And they only want to kill you. They actually eat human. They don't eat like bugs or anything else. They eat you, right? The snakes, 10 inches long, all poisonous, and they can fly, right? It's just crazy. Every shark attack, this is true. I watched Shark Week the week before I went. 100% of the shark attacks they showed was off the coast of Australia, right where I was going. So surfing was not a hobby that I picked up while I was there. But the general consensus is, you want to be killed by something out in nature? Go to Australia. And Jesus here is saying, you want to be a man or woman of God? and be martyred, go to Jerusalem. You want to praise Yahweh and walk in his ways and be killed quickly, go to Jerusalem. That's the reputation that they have earned. And so notice, like last week, this isn't something they used to do back in history. This isn't, yeah, they killed Isaiah, but that's back then. That's hundreds and hundreds of years ago. According to Jesus, this is a very present reality. How? Because they're in the middle of the greatest rejection in history. They're not just rejecting another prophet. They're rejecting the prophet with a capital P. They're not just rejecting another messenger. They're rejecting the message himself, God's word who's come to them. God himself is here. And they're rejecting him, and soon they will kill him. And notice what is he there to do? They're rejecting the one who, what, is there to save them. Look at what Jesus says in verse 38. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. They're rejecting and they're going to kill their own Savior. It's this image of you bleeding out on the street and the paramedic is rushing to you and he's got all the equipment he needs to revive you and bring you back to life and you kill him. That's what Jerusalem is doing, not just to another messenger saying, follow God's law, to the Savior himself who's coming so that they might have life. And so because of this rejection, because they have rejected life himself, Jesus gives this judgment in verse 38, see, your house is left desolate, is left abandoned, is left empty. Jesus is almost quoting uh, verbatim uh, Jeremiah 22. But if you will not obey these words, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house will become a desolation. So notice what Jesus is saying. This isn't a future warning of something that's going to come. This is the new present reality. 
It's not your house will be desolate. Jesus is not saying the exact same thing Jeremiah is saying. He's saying it is. As you reject me, the judgment is here. It, will, it is desolate. So he pronounces the judgment. It's kind of his final word. And they've been on this courtyard outside of the temple for, for all of Tuesday. And now Jesus is finally walking out the door. And as he walks out the door of the temple, we get chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Okay, so the, the, they're walking out. And as they're walking out, the disciples are enamored uh, by the big building. Hey, I just thought you know, we have an, a new building too. What, what providence, right? Enamored by a building. And we have a new building that just opened up. So they're, they're, they're enamored by the building. Mark makes it a bit clearer. Mark says, as they came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones, and what, what, what a wonderful building. And so we have in the scriptures, three temples. You have the first temple that Solomon built. David wants to build God a house. God says, you're a man of war. Your son Solomon is going to do it. We see that in the Chronicles. That will get destroyed by Babylon uh, in, in the first exile. And then when uh, the Israel returns from Persia, Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple with Ezra and Nehemiah. And they build it up. And everyone that has not seen the first temple of Solomon cheers. And everyone who saw Solomon's temple cries because it's just kind of so puny compared. The temple that Jesus is in the midst of that his disciples are marveling at is actually the, a third temple that Herod has built. Herod was known as being just this kind of master builder uh, of all things, and he built this breathtaking temple. In this day, in Ephesus, there was a, a temple to Artemis, the, uh, the Greek god Artemis. That was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, and it was said, it was known in that day, the temple in Jerusalem that Herod built is even more breathtaking. There were these massive marble-washed stones that were just huge, interlaid with gold. And so it wasn't just impressive to look at. It was thought it's indestructible. Even if you wanted to, you couldn't really tear this thing down. And so the disciples are marveling at it right after Jesus just said, this house is going to be left desolate. And so Jesus draws their eyes to the beauty. Look at verse 2. He draws their eyes to the beautiful temple. He answered them, you see all these, do you not? Look at these big stones. Look at all this gold. Look at this marvelous temple. Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. You see all this beauty, all this breathtaking, wonderful architecture? It will all be thrown down. Notice, it's not a natural disaster. It's not an earthquake that's going to destroy this temple. Something's going to come in and judge and actively throw down this temple. This is a massive statement for Jesus to make. In fact, we're going to find out when Jesus goes on trial, several people overhear this and they actually bring it as an accusation of why Jesus should be crucified. This is a massive statement for Jesus to make. And the real question is why? Why is prophesying a building being destroyed such a big deal? And so I want to back up. I want to do a little bit of biblical theology of the temple with you to show you what is Jesus really saying and why does it get the reaction that it gets? So if we start in Genesis 1, we see the Garden of Eden, which the more you read the scriptures, you realize the Garden of Eden is meant to be this kind of cosmic temple where heaven and earth dwell together where God and man dwell together, where man walks with God in the cool of the day, heaven and earth together, and then sin absolutely rips them apart. How can sinful man dwell in the presence of a holy and righteous God? The answer is he can't, and so he has to go away from God's presence. And as Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, God puts a guardian cherub, an angel with a flaming sword, to guard the way back into God's presence. So if Adam and Eve turn around and try to go back in, they'll be killed. Man cannot go into God's presence. And so fast forward to Exodus. As God delivers Israel and calls them out into the wilderness. Why? So that he can be their God and they can be their people. What's the first kind of great construction work they're told to get to? Building the tabernacle, a place where in the Holy of Holies, God's presence can dwell. And again, we can have heaven and earth dwelling together. How can man go in the presence of a holy God? And so we have the sacrificial system 
You have the book of Leviticus, right? You can thank your sin for the book of Leviticus, right? The tons of sacrifices are going to be, have to be made. Why? To make atonement for man's sin so that God can dwell in their midst and they not be instantly killed. And then you have the tabernacle, I mean the, the temple that David wants to build, which is just a permanent tabernacle. It's not a tent. It's a, it's a huge building that's going to be permanently in the city of the great king in Jerusalem, this place where God's presence dwells with man, where heaven and earth meet in the same place. So notice, the great thing about the temple has never been the building. It's never been how pretty the architecture is. The great thing about the building is God is there. Our God is dwelling with us. That's what Israel cares about. That's the tragedy of getting kicked out of the garden. We're we're being sent away from the presence of our God, and we can't go back in without dying. There's even a scene in, in Numbers where Israel rebels and God forgives them and God says, okay, you can go into the promised land. I'll give you the promised land, but I'm not gonna go with you. And Moses says, no, kill us instead. We need you with us. We need your presence with us. That is what's so amazing about the temple. That's why the temple is special. And so it was thought, you threaten us that enemies are gonna come and, and destroy us? No way, why? Our God is with us. The temple is still t- standing. It's this image of security, right? In fact, many, many prophets that in, in the Old Testament said Babylon's going to come. Their response was, no way, the temple's still standing. And so to say that the temple is going to be torn down is not just saying this pretty building you like is going to be torn down. Jesus is saying you will see the reality that God has left you. You will see the reality your house has been left desolate. God has left you. You are on your own. It's a visible picture of an invisible reality, the, the, the temple actually being destroyed. And this is going to happen. So Jesus is saying these words around 33-ish AD, around 70 AD. Rome, a general named Titus, different Titus than your, your Bible, uh, is, is going to surround the city, besiege the city, eventually invade, and they will tear down the temple. Every stone will be thrown down. And if you go to Rome today and you've been to the Colosseum, right next to the Colosseum is the Roman Forum, which is just like every ruin they can find thrown into one place. And if you go in, right when you walk in, there's an arch, because when a Roman general would have a great victory and they would march back into Rome, they would put an arch there that they could walk through triumphantly. And if you walk through the first arch, it's the Arch of Titus. If you look, what's engraved into the arch, you'll see Roman soldiers carrying away the lampstand that was in the temple because they've just raided and destroyed the temple. So that is going to happen in 70 AD. Jesus is prophesying something that will happen, but there's kind of two judgments here. There's two judgments here. The temple will be destroyed, but that's not going to happen for 40 more years. So what's the big deal about what Jesus is actually saying? The building will be torn down, but we've just said that's just a visible, that's just making the invisible reality visible. What is the actual greater judgment or the real judgment in this passage? When Israel was rebelling against God and Babylon was about to come and it's being prophesied over and over and over again, before the temple is actually destroyed, Ezekiel gets this vision in Ezekiel 10 and 11 and God takes him and he overlooks the temple and people are going in and out of the temple and the priests are working in the temple and Ezekiel sees this vision of God's presence that was dwelling in the Holy of Holies coming up out and leaving and going away and nobody notices. They just keep going about their day And Ezekiel learns that's the actual judgment. God has left us. Then Babylon will come through later and destroy the building. But again, that's just a visible picture of the invisible reality. And the exact same thing is happening here. Rome will destroy the temple 40 years later. What's the true judgment here? Where is the kind of Ezekiel God leaving the temple here in this passage? It's in verse 1. Jesus left the temple. It's in Jesus' words, you will not see me again. Where is the true white-hot presence of God? Is it the burning bush? Is it a cloud on Mount Sinai? No. It's when God, the Word, who was with God at creation and was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Where does heaven and earth truly and perfectly meet? In the person of Jesus. Where do we see God and man, 
dwelling together in a wonderful hypostatic union, to use the fun theological term, in the person of Jesus Christ. Where do we see the true temple? In the person of Jesus Christ. And he's just walked out the door. And do you know what the people of Jerusalem do? They go right back into the temple and sing God's praises. They don't notice. Their house has been left desolate. The presence of God that they were made for, the glory that they were made to praise has just walked out the door and nobody cares. In fact, they've encouraged it. That's the judgment here. You will not see me again. Yes, Rome will come and destroy, but that's just making their present reality visible for everyone to see. John 1, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Jesus, God's presence, walks out the door. That's the judgment of this passage. That is the weightiness of Jesus' words, not the stones themselves, but him leaving after his rejection. So like last week, how does this press us? Is it, do you like this building more than the presence of Jesus? No, 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 not so much. What is Jerusalem's problem? What is it? that is causing Jerusalem, the people, not just the leaders, to reject Jesus, give him this cold welcome and cry out, crucify him in a couple days. Jerusalem, and in fact, all of Israel, they have religion, but it's a religion of their own making. It's tailor-made for all their comforts and all their preferences. They've got the form of religion, and when Jesus shows up and says, lay down your life and follow me, and says, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And says, if you're insulted for my name, you're blessed. And says, instead of taking up arms against those who you hate, be meek. Be poor in spirit. Be a peacemaker. Whenever he says, pick up your cross, lay down your life, and follow me, they say, no thanks. I'm good. I've got religion. I've got the temple. I've got my songs. I've got my laws. I'm fine. Please go away. And they reject him. Jerusalem is showing us it is very possible to have the form of religion and deny its reality. Miss the Savior, the Lord, the King of kings that is right in front of your face. Now, let me ask you, Bible Belt residents, is there any place in the world who has tailored religion more to our comforts and more to our preferences, and more to our liking, we set the terms more than Dallas, Texas. You don't like this church? Don't worry. There's 97 other churches in this city you can go choose from. And you don't like one of those? Keep, just keep hopping around. Your preferences will eventually be met. You'll find someone who doesn't press on your comforts. You'll find someone who will just kind of affirm however you already want to live, and we do. Church shopping is a normal thing. It's a normal term, even. We shopped around for a while, and we finally found a place. And we don't say that met all of our preferences and our needs. Like last week, we're very much in danger of the Pharisees' hypocrisy. This week, we're very much in danger of Jerusalem's loving the form of religion, loving the praise songs, loving the speaker who's fun and entertaining but rejecting the Savior that's right in front of us, or more particularly, rejecting the Lord who's right in front of us. Does that press on us at all? Has he walked out the door? If he walked out the door, would we notice? Or would we just keep on going? Because we've got all of our songs, we've got all of our sermons, we've got everything. But we've missed the very presence that we were made for. There is severe judgment for that sort of blindness. And let me just say the most terrifying thing. We're often blind to it. The terrifying nature of sin is it blinds you to your own sin. Again, Jerusalem, they don't think I'm rejecting the God of the universe. They think I'm rejecting some random homeless rabbi who doesn't think we're here to defeat Rome, which is clearly what we're going to do. Oh, don't reject the reality of the Son of God. Let his words settle on you, and when you feel the sting 
of conviction, throw your arms open and say, I trust the God of the universe more than myself. Adore his presence. Adore his nearness, even when he says, lay down your life. Only when a seed goes into the ground and dies will it bear fruit. Adore his words, not just when he says, I'm going to build a mansion for you in heaven and I'll come get you, but adore his words when he says, you are going to be sent out like sheep among wolves. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. Do you adore those words like you adore the heaven promise words? Do you adore his people? Do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Or are you just looking for a community that you click with? Do you long to wash each other's feet and bear one another's burdens and consider one another better than yourselves? Are you looking for personalities that mesh? You see the difference. Your merciful Savior is showing you there's a radical difference between having religion, the form of religion, and having me. Don't miss me. That's the judgment of this passage. The temple will be torn down, but the temple's left desolate here. That's the first thing that we see. Again, a heavy, heavy, tough word from our Savior. And the next thing we see is something I I love. I love the scriptures. (laughs) Be encouraged. Your pastor likes the Bible. I love... Our God puts things like what we're about to look at in the Bible and doesn't just show you his rules. He shows you his heart. So Jesus is pronouncing heavy, heavy words that should make anyone with breath squirm. And then he gives us verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have, would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings but you were not willing. Look at the first thing you see. You see that doubling of Jerusalem, which anytime you see that in the scriptures, that's just the person saying something twice is showing you just the depth of their emotion. There's a scene where Absalom, which is uh, David's son, long hair, very beautiful man he's described. He actually rebels against his father and tries to kill and take over the, kill his father and take over the kingdom. And David has to flee. David's men actually beat Absalom's men. Absalom is killed and they're coming back into the city. And a report comes back to David that Absalom, your son, has been killed. And this is how we see David react. And the king, David, was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. Listen, now he describes this. And he went and said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. We see this in Jesus' words. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And then he gives maybe the most caring image possible. I have longed to grab you and take you under my wings like a mother hen does its chicks. I've longed to protect you. I've, I'm here as God coming down to bring you in, to be your savior, to protect you from wrath, but you wouldn't have it. We see this image of God over and over again all throughout the Psalms. I'll just read two. It's everywhere in the Psalms. God longing to gather his people under his wings. How precious, Psalm 36. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge under the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from the river of your delight. And from with the fountain of life, in your light do we have light. Psalm 17, wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior, of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who would do me violence and the deadly enemies who would surround me. You see this. This is how God's described as someone who's taking you in. Your enemies are pursuing you. We see with David over and over again, he's literally hiding in caves. What's my refuge? Is it literally a fort or a fortress that Saul can't get in? No, it's God's wings. It's God coming around and taking me in. And Jesus is saying, I want so badly. I have longed to do this with you. I've just pronounced this judgment on. I've longed to take you in, but you wouldn't have it. 
You wouldn't have me. And so we're seeing here something very, very important. We're seeing the heart of Jesus as he speaks very, very difficult words. The heart of Jesus as he speaks very difficult words. And this is very important for you and me to see for a couple reasons. I, I talked last week, I mentioned, we're going to get to learn a lot about how we ought to speak as Christians, seeing these two sermons back to back. Heavy, tough words with a broken heart, with a bleeding heart, longing for those who are hearing the heavy, tough words to be saved. And, and this is very important for us. One reason is for how we speak. I don't know if you, I don't know how in tune with kind of evangelical debates you are, but how we are to speak as Christians is a massive, massive uh, debated topic today. A massive debated topic. As our world has just kind of gone crazy, I don't know the right word for it, as our world has just Totally, uh, uh, the Western world in particular has just manifested a particular type of wickedness. The world's always been fallen since Genesis 3, so the world's sinning ought not to surprise us. But there's just a particular, as we've lost our, lost our grip on what is a man, what is a woman, as we demand that my truth can't just be tolerated by you, it must be celebrated by you, and anything short of celebration is abuse. Uh, as our world has just kind of aggressively gone that way, the church is kind of thinking through, how do we respond to this? How ought we to interact with, with a world that is, that is aggressively post-truth and aggressively demanding we kind of get in line with what's kind of PC in the day, what's acceptable, what's tolerant, what's celebrated? And so there's, there's uh, in the church, uh, I love church history. One of the things that you see in church history, anytime you see a, a scary movement or a, a bad movement one way, the church tends to respond not with, okay, let's go see what the Bible would say. They, they tend to respond with a, a pendulum swing, if you will. Uh, so for instance, in the 19th and 20th century, we saw this massive movement of liberal theology. So denial of the resurrection, kind of stripping out all the miracles from your Bible, Thomas Jefferson, uh, just denial of the deity of Jesus. So anything supernatural, anything that wasn't just morals was kind of stripped out of the scriptures. That's liberal theology. And the response to that, as you might know, what was kind of the group that responded to that? Fundamentalists? I saw someone mouth that, but didn't say any words. Um, f the fundamentalist movement was kind of a response. And it starts off good, you know, where uh, the resurrection happened and the scriptures are inerrant. There's, there's good movements. And then after a while, it didn't take long for the fundamentalists to become known as really aggressive uh, and very, very combative. It was just kind of the, the spirit that they spoke with. Um, they drew hard lines between us and them, really quick to demonize people. I kind of saw creeping liberalism behind every corner. It got to the point to where Billy Graham was being publicly called a false teacher by, by many leading fundamentalists. And they became more known for their aggression uh, than actually the content of what they were arguing for. In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who's a, a 20th century preacher and pastor who lived through this, uh, it was it probably might have even called himself a fundamentalist. One of his biggest kind of heartaches was uh, he used to be a doctor before he was a pastor, and he said, surgeons see cancer and they want to re remove it. That's a good thing. It's a good thing to have a knife and, and want to remove cancer. But there's something called a surgeon mentality where you become knife happy. And your first response to any headache is you want to cut someone open and look for the cancer. And he said, that's what's happening right now in kind of the pendulum swing. And instead of the gospel proclamation being what the fundamentalists were known for, it was that aggression. And there's, I mean, fundamentalism has almost died out today. You won't find a whole lot of people being like, I'm a fundamentalist because that's, that's the, uh, the reputation that they earned. And so right now, we're in the middle of a pendulum thing. As our world is denying kind of what a man is, what a woman is, all these, all these post-truth things, we're in the middle of a pendulum swing, particularly with our speech. And so two kind of things we see is, one, you'll hear kind of one group say, if you're on the side of truth, if you're saying a true thing, how you say it, your tone doesn't matter. Okay, you're on the side of truth. We're fighting a post-truth world and they're all about tone and if you offend me, you're wrong. So they're responding to that and saying, actually, your tone doesn't matter. And so some characteristics of this kind of pendulum swing would be uh, if you're on the side of truth, they would argue you actually can't be arrogant. 
It's impossible. It's, it, you can't be arrogant if you're on the side of truth. You kind of get this ends justify the means. It doesn't matter kind of what damage we cause as we're trying to get to truth, right? Because the world's going to hell, right? So yeah, we might cause some damage along the way, but we're on the side of truth. So we hear things like truth at all costs and things like that from this group. Uh, it's kind of engages in what I call conservative cancel culture. Uh, so cancel culture is a, if you're not on Twitter, it's just when people, a whole bunch of people get mad enough and then the generic world decides cancel, right? And then you're not allowed to be an actor anymore or whatever. Um, so if you're a, a preacher and your clip will get pulled and tweeted and then someone will say they've gone woke and there we say goodbye to whoever. They've gone woke and they kind of see that around every culture or every uh, corner, quick to demonize. Uh, they're more known by what they're against than what they're for. Uh, I, I came to this church five years ago to plant a church. That was actually the original plan. Uh, the Lord's graciously rerouted that. But one of the things that church planting coaches will tell you is you don't want to plant a, we're not that church. Uh, and so one of the most dangerous things for a planter to do is be in a church where they're just primarily frustrated because you're just going to go do, you're, you're, you're going to be like, we're not them, look at us. Uh, and so that's typically what you see here. And then the last thing, they're, they're driven by extreme fear of the world particularly fear of the left. And fear-mongering is probably the most normal tool to try and get you to do things. Raise your kids this way or whatever because the government's coming for your kids, right? will be a typically typical thing that you'll hear. So that's, that's one pendulum swing that we're kind of living through right now. There's another one uh, that's called, I don't know if you know this term, it's called the Moscow Mood. Uh, so there's a, there's a pastor in Moscow, Idaho named Doug Wilson. I typically don't say pastor's names from the front, but I say his name for two reasons. One, he is kind of the figurehead of this movement that's growing like crazy. There's literally people moving to Idaho to, to follow him. And two, just be, quite frankly, I have grown pastorally concerned enough uh, with uh, Doug Wilson's influence, particularly around speech, uh, that I think it's helpful to be clear on what to avoid. He's not a false teacher by any means. I'd agree with some of the things that he says. He's helpful in some areas, but particularly in the area of speech, he, is, uh, he, he embodies and encourages a type of speech that's called the Moscow mood that is very aggressive. In fact, he argues for vulgarity. Uh, and I thought about putting up some quotes from him, but quite frankly, they were too inappropriate to even, even put up on the stage. But he argues for a kind of biting, bitter, angry, there's, there's an actual quote, biting, bitter, angry, take no prisoners, language, a, a kind of mocking of the dumb world and a, a scoffing that he, he believes is biblically appropriate. And that to me is the most dangerous thing. It's not just this should be okay. It's the Bible argues for this, he would say. So that's another pendulum swing. Uh, most pastors I talk to in the area, when I say, what are you dealing with in your church? It is those two pendulum swings how to bring our people back to love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And so one of the things Jesus is doing here, which is why I take a lot of time to unpack this, one of the things that are seeing Jesus speak heavy, unblinking, tough, uncompromising words, which we said last week, Christians ought to say, I'm not arguing for a skipping through the field Christianity Jesus who's never mad at everybody and just gives hugs. He's giving tough words, and we should as well. It should be a part of Christianity. But Jesus is showing us here, what is the heart that those words, words are flowing from? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's happening in Jesus' heart? Is he angry and cynical and mocking Jerusalem? Or is he weeping? Is his heart broken over their sin? So again, here, pendulum swing, we, we've got to come back a little bit to biblical reality and actually follow Jesus. Because one of the things these, these two kind of branches do really well is they will highlight flipping the tables Jesus. They'll highlight seven woes Jesus. They'll highlight uh, Elijah, prophets of Baal kind of speech. But what they miss tragically is his tears. They miss the scriptures cracking open the heart of Jesus and saying, look at the bleeding heart of the one who's actually saying these things. And the one who says to you, follow me. Should you stand against craziness in the world? Yes. Should you be on the side of truth? Absolutely. But do you do it with your eyes rolling? Look at the people who are making our world crazy, scoffing and mocking. Absolutely not. You follow your Savior with a bleeding heart. When you watch the news and it makes you upset, as it ought to, does it drive you to tweet 
or does it drive you to pray? You see the difference. If someone were to describe your speech, would you be primarily known by the Beatitudes? Their speech is poor in spirit. They, they're humble. They know. But for the grace of God, I'm no different. Would they describe you as a peacemaker? Would they describe you as meek? Would they describe the fruit of the Spirit? His speech is loving. It's joyful. It's patient. He's really, really patient. She's really, really patient. Or would they describe mocking, cynical, hard-hearted, right, but hard-hearted. See the difference between those two. If we're going to have the aroma of Christ in our speech, let's see the heart that those words are flowing from. You see that? So that's the first thing. If we're going to follow him, if we're going to speak the truth in love, if we're going to correct one another in gentleness, as Paul would tell Timothy and the Ephesians. Be on the side of truth, yes, but speak the truth in love. Correct one another with gentleness. Those are the footsteps. That's the heart that our speech needs to be flowing from. So that's the first thing. But the second thing, perhaps more importantly, wouldn't be just how are we meant to speak, but how is Jesus speaking? I mean, again, just look at what we're getting to glimpse into. What you believe about God's character, what you believe about who God is, will color the world for you more than anything else. And so when you sin and you need to repent, if you view a God with his arms crossed and saying, how many chances am I going to have to give you until you finally get it right? Or someone who's like, I don't even know if you're saved because you're not performing well enough. Or someone who's like, okay, I love you. I don't like you because you are my screw-up kid. Is that going to color how you repent? Is that going to color your joy in the Christian life? Is that going to color how you, how you see your God, but what if you see a God like this, who when I fall, when I reject him, when I fail and I turn to him and I run, I see open nail-scarred hands saying, I have longed for you to run here. I'm still longing for you to run here so that I can put my wing over you and protect you from wrath. You see the difference between that? I love that the Bible doesn't want you to guess at who your God is and who your Savior is. This is who Jesus is, even in the midst of the harshest condemnation, the heaviest words that he gives in all of the scriptures, someone who longs for them to repent. That's who you run to in repentance, a Jesus who has tears. So we've seen the judgment, we've seen the tears. One more thing I want to see, or I want to look at that I think rounds out this passage, which is Jesus's Rain. Look at verse 39. We'll just look at verse 39. For I tell you, this is as he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, your house is left desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you will not see me again. We've already talked about it. That's him leaving the temple. What about the second part? You won't see me again until you see, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What's Jesus getting at? He's quoting Psalm 118. Where have we seen this before, actually? Does anybody remember? Triumphal entry. As Jesus is coming in on a cult, people are waving the palm branches. They say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Matthew 21. So we've seen that before, but what is Jesus getting at now? That was two days ago. You won't see me again until you say this Praise. That is a phrase, if you remember that sermon, that is a phrase that you would say in Psalm 118 when the king comes in. That's not just a random thing you say. That is a say when the king comes in. So Jesus is saying, quite frankly, this. I came in once on a donkey and you rejected me. The next time I'm going to come in, it will not be on a donkey. It will not be humble as your savior. It will be on a war horse the second coming, the final judgment, it will be as a conquering king. And blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord will be extracted from your lips. Here's what Jesus is showing. It's both wonderful and terrifying. Every knee will bow to King Jesus. Every knee will bow to King Jesus. Reject him all you want. You cannot change that reality. Every knee will bow to King Jesus. The question for you is, will you bow the knee to the humble servant Savior coming in on a donkey, King Jesus? 
Or will you be forced to bow the knee to King Jesus coming, not to save you, but to conquer you? Those are the two paths. There is no third. That is wonderful for those in Christ. That is terrifying for those outside of Christ. You will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus' reign, he will reign you. It's not a question of if he will. It's a question of how he will. Will he be your humble savior coming to die for you or will you be forced to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord by the conquering king? That's where we're leaving it. As their house is left desolate, I will see you again, but your chance is gone. So there's a little window there in the midst of a very heavy, heavy words from Jesus for repentance. Bow the knee before you're forced to bow the knee. And I just want to say, look at who you get to bow the knee to. The one who longs to care for you. The one who longs to take wrath for you. The one who loves you with a love that is incomprehensible. So those are the two roads where this passage is leaving us. Bow the knee this way or bow the knee this way. You will bow the knee. He will reign. Which will it be? Will it be to the conquering king Or will it be to the humble Savior King? And in those two roads, you see, if you refuse, like Jerusalem is doing, you will lose the King's presence, your house will be left desolate, and you will gain the King's wrath. But if you choose the road of the disciple, if you choose the Palm Sunday road, and you bow the knee to the humble Savior, instead of getting the King's wrath, the King takes wrath for you, you gain the King's wing. And as the wrath of God pours down, he protects you from it. And instead of losing the king's presence, you get to say, like David in Psalm 23, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Instead of losing Jesus' presence, you hear the sweet words, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so the question is, how can he actually promise that? How can Jesus promise to take away the wrath and to give you God's unending presence because on the cross he is going to take the wrath meant for you and as you're united to him you come under his wing and how can he promise God's presence because the big question our main problem hasn't been Rome or any government our main problem has been a holy God as sinful people our main problem is the guardian cherub with the flaming sword and stitched into the thick curtain of the holy of holies in the temple is a guardian cherub And as Jesus takes the wrath that you deserve, what happens to the curtain? It's torn from top to bottom. Why? Because that wrath of the cherub's sword has fallen on him. And now all those who are in him have a way to the Father. The ultimate goal of life is to be in God's presence. What does Moses ask for when he gets one thing from God? I want to see your glory. I want to be in your presence. And he's told no. Man can't look upon my face and live. And here we see in Jesus Christ, we with unveiled faces get to behold what? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God where? In the face of Jesus Christ. You have a shelter for all the infinite wrath you're worthy of, that I'm worthy of. And you have an unending presence with God that can never be taken away from you. The choice is, will you reject him Or will you bow the knee and repent? In C.S. Lewis's book, The Silver Chair, in his Narnia series for kids, Jill is a child who shows up in Narnia. She doesn't really know where she is, and she's been separated from her companion, and she's lost, and she's dying of thirst, and she finally finds a stream, and she, she goes towards the stream. But on the other side of the stream is this great lion, Aslan who's Jesus in in the stories. And she's very uncomfortable, as you would imagine. And Aslan says to her, if you're thirsty, you may drink. And the voice, she says, was deeper and wider and heavier than she'd ever imagined. And she doesn't know what to do because there's a lion there. And the lion says again, are you thirsty? And she says, I'm dying of thirst. And the lion says, then drink. And she takes a step forward. And then she says, can you go somewhere else? And Aslan gives her a look and a low growl, and she realizes she might as well have asked the mountain to move. And then he again says, drink. And she asks, do you eat little girls? And Aslan says, I have swallowed girls and boys. 
women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms. And she said, well, I dare not come then. And he said, but you'll die of thirst. And she says, well, I'll I'll go look for another stream. And Aslan scoots forward and says, there is no other stream. And she comes and she drinks terrified. And in an instant, her thirst is quenched. And it was the most refreshing, cool water that she had ever drank. That's what you're being offered by Jesus here. There is no other stream. There's no other way by which man can be saved. Come drink of the living water, King Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that this is the wonderful reality and the message of the gospel that has been given to us in your son. I pray that we would even right now, as your spirit is at work, as we know your spirit is in our midst, that uh, we'd be quick to repent, Lord, that we would not cling to sin or we would not cling to uh, a way of life that we think is leading to life when over and over again you tell us it, it doesn't. There's one way of life. It's your son. He doesn't have the way of life. He is life himself. He is the truth. He is the way to you, Father. And so I pray that, as we prayed at the beginning, that you would make him wonderful before our eyes. You would make him precious to us, that the marveling the disciples had if they looked at the golden lace stones, we would have a hundredfold for the wonderful, glorious face of your son, and that he would melt away any false desire for sin. I pray that we would follow his example in all things, that we would joyfully lay our life down, that we would say with Paul, I consider all that I've gained worth nothing compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, let us say that joyfully, Father, because of the wonderful work you've done in our hearts. I pray in your son's name, Jesus' name, amen.